Common Knowledge is brought to you by PureMTGO.com and InkedGaming.com. Use coupon code CCMTG10 at checkout for a 10% discount on all Inked Gaming supplies and accessories. You can support the show directly through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash common knowledge. This is the Common Knowledge Podcast. It's not about the cost. It's about the knowledge. Here are your hosts, Brandon Clark and Lauber. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to episode 70 of the Common Knowledge Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon, and join with me on the line is the Gurmag Angler himself, Sean the Lobbert. Brah. Brah. <laughs> 70 is a lot of episodes. It's so many episodes. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of getting up there. We've kind of been around a while, I feel like. <clears throat> anyway, how are how are you this week? Great. I'm great. I'm excited because uh, we've got fun, exciting stuff going on for the popper world. Oh, yes, we do. This is going to be... I think one of our longest episodes, like it feels like it going into it just because of how many cards we have and we're doing the modern horizons spoiler for those of you who just had this autoplay or something and didn't read the thumbnail. Yeah. Set review day. And, uh, this is going to be a doozy of a set review. There are so many cards. I mean, we have our top five. I think our top five was pretty cut and dry, but you know obvious like what our top fives were when we made them but there were just so many other cards that we had to give honorable mentions to that we wanted to shout out or talk about a little bit so uh buckle up (laughs) this is gonna be a long one since we're not doing a uh, power rankings this week due to the banning that happened like to the end of last month we just didn't think the data was relevant and we'll get back to power rankings next month when we've got a full month of data Despite that, before we get to our set review, we still need to do our Patreon giveaway. So do you want to go ahead and generate a random number? Okay. Uh, 10 people eligible. Number is 10? Number 10, Stephanie Pace. Congratulations. It looks like she is one of our newest patrons, maybe? She, yeah, this is the first time, like, as of 6-1, they are, <laughs> they're a, a patron and... They they immediately won, so awesome. Well, there's thank you no so justice much. in this world, and congratulations. <laughs> no, there's plenty of justice for uh, Stephanie. <laughs> thank you so much for your support. It means the absolute world to us. Uh, we're going to reach out to you shortly uh, to get a little some information from you on where we can send the cards if you want them damaged. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that there's only three cards uh because this you know there's nothing for this episode because we didn't choose a card unless so, do you, want to you know try what? To do something for her? yeah i'll just find um something cool out of the new set how's that sound okay do you want to do maybe our number one yeah let's do our number one you get a play set of oh, oh. spoilers <laughs> i just i made a big spoiler sean's gonna edit it out at the end of the show, you're going to find out what you'll be receiving. <laughs> but other than that, you're going to be receiving a, four copies of Moldrifter, four copies of Moldervine Cloak, and four copies of Elusive Spellfist. Ooh, Elusive. Oh, wait. Thank- is Elusive Spellfist the previous month? I don't oh, think well. so. No, whatever. That, that spell, Spellfist was <laughs> our April Power Rankings one. We're so. going to figure it out. Yeah. You're going to get 12 cards. Signed yeah. by us if that's what you want. If you don't want it, I don't. I don't blame you. I won't sign them. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's up to you. So far, everyone has wanted them signed, though. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Stephanie, you're amazing. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world to us. You rock. Okay, so yeah, let's just we're just gonna jump into the set review, starting with white. Main topic. Our first card is Answered Prayers. One white white for an enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. Not very exciting. 
The rest of the text, if answered prayers isn't a creature, it becomes a 3-3 angel with flying in addition to its other types until end of turn. Yeah, so this... I, I usually the it being an enchantment and gaining you life means it's pretty art, hard to interact with, but this does become a creature. Um, the first turn it comes out, it is not a creature pretty much every time, and then after that, like so, it it has protection from removal spells for the first turn, and then it becomes a creature. But just a a, a big flying creature that gains you a bunch of life seems pretty good. Yeah, what do you think about this for, like, sideboards against burn? Like, if you're just, like, a white deck? That seems fine, depending on the deck. You'd really have to put a lot of creatures onto the battlefield. Like, maybe for, like, a white weenie deck. But, yeah, the reason I don't think this makes, like, a top five or anything... Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. There's really powerful cards in this set. But there's not a deck, I think, that is immediately just going to be slotting this in. Right? Yeah. Next card, Enduring Sliver. One and a white for a creature's sliver. It's a 2-2 with Outlast. Uh, so this is a Cons of Tarkir uh, mechanic, or well, Cons block. I think it was Fate Reforged where it showed up. But two cut generic mana, tap the creature, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. Outlast only as a sorcery, and it gives all other sliver creatures you control Outlast 2. And I, I feel like this is, you know, better than than what it looks like on the face. Most, like, we didn't ever get an Outlast creature that was even playable, but a lot of Slivers players like to sit back and wait for their Slivers to be huge until it's completely safe and then attack. And that can this kind of fits the bill, right? Mm -hmm. Also, can we just shout out, going back to the true Sliver form, we're off that Predator BS. Yeah, I don't know why they made them humanoid. I like this this pointy slithery boy a lot better yeah so slithery cool next card ephemerate single white for an instant exile target creature you control then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control and it has rebound so this card on its face is basically just a soul sh shift no cloud shift cloud, cloud shift. shift yeah soul shift is the mechanic um, it's just like Cloud Shift, but this card has Rebound. And I think that makes it way more playable. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously putting Gravy on a card is obviously going to make it more playable. What I initially wanted to do was use it like Ghostly Flicker to flicker my my guy that gets stuff back from the graveyard and then get itself back and then have it, when it rebounds, do it to something else. But it kind of works the opposite way of like, this card isn't immediately in your graveyard the first time. So, like, the You've first half of it... Like you rebound it. Yeah, the first half of it gets gets the different spell, and then the second half gets this the ephemerate back, which might be better, because then you actually have that spell up front, like a counter spell or a protection spell. I don't know. It, it does seem like it can could be really, really good to me. Yeah, I think it could potentially be a contender alongside Ghostly Flicker. It being one mana. I I mean, Ghostly Flicker obviously does a lot more. It hits any permanent. It hits two. Yeah. But this just being one mana and having rebound, I think it's really powerful. Yeah, and it also is, doesn't go in an existing deck, I don't think, but a blue-white control list kind of deal, mm -hmm. I think, could have legs. Cool. So this next card is a little less impressive. It yeah. is Irregular Cohort. Two white, white for a changeling, uh, meaning that that card can be every creature type. It's a 2 2. When it comes into play, it gets a 2 2 shapeshifter creature token with changeling. So basically, if you're a tribal deck of some kind, maybe four mana generate. Two, two, two slivers is something in your wheelhouse. I know that deck likes to be a lot more aggressive, and I don't know that they want to put a four drop in their deck, but that would yeah. be kind of the application that this card's looking for. I do think it's a little too expensive, and making two bodies, eh, it, there's probably something in your individual creature type that that does something like this. Like, you know, slivers does have the three mana version that makes one ones. And mm -hmm. I guess an extra mana for two, well, an extra power and toughness on each creature could be worth it, but I'm 
Again, I think I'm doubtful on that. Yeah. All right. Our next card is Martyr's Soul. This is a 3-2 spirit for two and a white. Has Convoke. So your creatures can help you cast this card. They can help you. When Martyr's Soul enters the battlefield, if you control no tap lands, put two plus one plus one counters on it. So if you Convoke three creatures, you can put this card in this into play without paying any tapping any lands for it and then it comes into play as a 5-4 i think i i heard some people being really excited about this card i know with convoke the the hit to your tempo of like that's that's a turn where you're not attacking with three of your creatures which makes it harder to attack at the rest of your creatures as well is it's pretty tough but it is a 5-4 at the like that's what the goal of this card is i think having it's a, it's a 5-4 that you can play as early as turn two or yeah. i guess it'd only be a three two at that point because you'd have tap lands but so you can play it out as a three two on turn two like if you go turn one one drop turn two one drop one drop convoke this out or you wait until turn three and then you can cast this as a five four and then cast something else from your hand so I think like the utility of it like allowing you to double spell and just put a ton of power on the board is is kind of what the draw of the card is, but yeah, the the floor of it just being a 3/2 for 3 mana that's slightly easier to cast. The the tempo hit to attacking I think makes me shy away from this card. I don't know what kind of deck that this would go into, just something where you're like an aggressive white deck that is just kind of beating down is what I'm thinking and it, I don't think it makes that archetype more playable, so I'm not I'm not that excited about Martyr's Soul. Okay, Recruit the Worthy is the next card. It is a single white for an instant. Create a one-one white soldier creature token with buyback three. I'm not super excited about this card, but I felt like it needed a mention. Just like buyback, buyback is really powerful when you put it on any spell. Just like that creating that card advantage is really strong but four mana for a one one i think that there are just better ways you could be doing doing this like we already have sense enlistment you know which is different than buyback because it's retrace which i might argue is still just slightly better because you just throw away the lands you don't need anyway i don't know i i think i agree with you of that this it's a little bit overcosted. Uh, I, th I don't think you could make this cost less without making it way, like, really, really good. Yeah, but... you think it was two? Buyback two? It would just oh, that would, be, that would be busted. I was thinking, like, oh, buyback two, as in overall cost, would be three when mm -hmm. you went to cast it. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be really, really strong. Uh, but four, it's competing with Sen's Enlistment. Which already uh, doesn't really get played anyway. Well, part of the problem with Sen's Enlistment that I have is that it gets eaten out of the graveyard, and then you're just, like, left without that plan. Mm -hmm. And then this never hits the graveyard, which is nice. But it is going to be really, really slow, so it's going to have to be some kind of control deck that cares about it being instant. And yeah. I think it's something to watch, but not, not something that pops out as just amazing to me. Yeah. Our last white card is Trustworthy Scout. One and a white for a 2-2. Two -two. You can pay one in a white, exile Trustworthy Scout from your graveyard, search your library for a card named Trustworthy Scout, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So on its face, this sort of looks like a fixed Squadron Hawk. <laughs> um, but I actually feel like this card could be quite good in a white Tortured Existence deck. You're, mill you're kind of self-milling yourself, so you put one of these in your graveyard. For a one and a white, you can just guarantee that you have something that you can always throw away to tortured existence, or it just gives you added utility out of your graveyard. I think this card hmm. could be okay in some sort of white tortured existence thing. Yeah, I would have to be throwing it in the graveyard, because like, having it be a bearer on its front end, and then waiting for them to kill it, and then yeah. spending an extra two mana where you know something like Squadron Hawk wouldn't take so much mana, like... It's a lot of work, but if you have something to do with this card that is, like, 
a discard strategy like tortured existence yeah. that's where that's where it's gonna be good yeah granted though i i, I mean there's just so many good utility creatures that work with graveyards that this card may still not even make it into any deck list but i think it's yeah. good to have it like, on your radar if you're trying to trying to make something work it's it's like an option that's there i think it's worth an honorable mention at least yeah should we move on to the blue yeah i'll read the blue first we've got i kite it is a colorless and a blue so two for a one two with flying uh it is a drake i kite gets plus two plus zero as long as you've drawn two or more cards this turn so doesn't seem very good at blocking for sure and yeah. I know that one of the reasons that we say that flying is one of the most important keywords is so that you can block your opponent's uh, flying hordes. It can block any one toughness fairy, so that's I guess okay. Yeah, you have to you have to work to make this trade, even just trade with most of the other average flyers like uh, Skyfisher and Sectile Aberration, like. I mean, there are there are a lot of instant speed ways to draw multiple cards, mm -hmm. but still, that's just like you have to have this in play. You have to have the mana up. Your opponent has to attack into it, and then you cast your brainstorm. And then at that point, you're still just like trading this for something else. I personally don't think this card is very good, but I think I agree that it's not very good. Cool. Uh, the next card I have is Iceberg Cantrix. Uh, can, is, can cricks can crick can cricks it's a crab oh, so i wanted to say like cancer as in the like star sign kind of deal so i want to say cancer anyway it's a colorless and a blue for a zero four crab when another snow permanent enters the battlefield under your control you may have target player put the top two cards of their library into their graveyard so this is like kind of we get a hedron crab it has to be snow permanent so it's not going to yeah. be like a fetch land is them milling a whole bunch uh mm -hmm. so it does trigger off of you know yeah, if, if you hedron crab was four was it or really three, three. i'm just hedron trying to get up real quick. A lot of cards. it is three hedron crab was three yeah and it only cost one mana yeah, so, I mean, this is cool, and you can do it off of things like other Iceberg Cancerixes, and... I think that you could put this in, like, a Jace's Erasure deck. That's just the already a dedicated mill deck, and just slot this in. Like, it's a big body that buys you time, which is just what you need. It mills, you know, whenever you put other Snow Permanents into play, and just, like, put Snow-Covered Islands into your deck. Yeah, I, I like that the body is so big that... You know, you you feel comfortable blocking creatures out of, like, Stompy and get to Lava Runners. Like, it takes a bit for them to overwhelm this card. So it buys you the time that it needs to actually do something. You know, obviously, Mill isn't the best. Like, no, but I think that if I was going to try to make a Mill deck work, this is one of the cards I would start with. Right. Like, Jace's Erasure, this bunch of snow covered islands jace's like phantasm or something like that like yeah just get like a big wall of creatures and with just jace's or jace's phantasm you could block like one creature a turn and and so they're just losing one guy a turn with this they're losing i think you know they lose the one guy but then you're taking that much less damage so i think what that deck needs is and creatures you're and you're milling cards yeah so this card's sort of like is a double threat like it keeps you alive and it helps further your your game plan which jace's erasure just doesn't really do i think that might be a, a fun episode in the future is to to talk about mill as a strategy in popper and kind of why we don't see it what what kind of decks we see when it does pop up so maybe that's something for the future but are you ready to move on to moonblade shinobi yeah. moonblade shinobi is three and a blue for a three two human ninja it has ninjutsu for two and a blue when moonblade shinobi deals combat damage to a player create a one one blue illusion token with flying so this is a really powerful effect problem being though that two blue might be a little steep 
as a ninjutsu cost. Yeah, ninjutsu cards, it's always... I'm always like, okay, how are you getting them through the second time? Mm -hmm. And you you kind of have to expend some mana, and I guess it's not on the same turn that you play it. The turn that you play it, obviously, your creature's already getting through. It is expensive, and I think, I think the everything... Though, is that, yeah. like, the obvious creatures that you'd want to play, like Spell Surge Sprite, like, the, the thing that makes Ninja the Deep Hour so good is that it costs two. So on turn four, you can ninjutsu your spell source right back to hand and just automatically have protection up i don't think you can wait till like turn five to make sure you're protecting moonblade shinobi yeah yeah i think it suffers from being too expensive next we have pondering mage pondering mage is three blue blue for a three four human wizard when pondering mage enters the battlefield look at the top three cards of your library put them back in any order you may shuffle your library draw card this card, I think, is also really powerful, but it competes with Muldrifter. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. And that that's a, a horrible thing to have to do. Yeah. <laughs> Every five drop in blue is going to have to compete with Muldrifter from now until the end of time. I think that, like, the easiest way to think about this is how much are you willing to pay for a Ponder that comes with a 3-4, right? Yeah. And so basically, like, you're paying one blue mana for ponder and then you're paying three and a blue for a three four which is just not really on rate in this format does it matter that it's a wizard i might put this in like an azami edh deck <laughs> okay hear that everybody with an azami edh deck listening to a popper podcast pondering mage <laughs> next we have reign of revelation it is three and a blue for an instant Draw three cards, then discard a card. The fact that this is instant is pretty cool. That's pretty much all that gets it on all that gets it on this list, because there are plenty of of effects kind of like this. Um, I want to say that this competes with compulsive research. That is also draw three and then discard a land card, and it's sorcery and it only costs three. What do you think about this card? I think that if this card wasn't an instant it wouldn't even make it onto the list at all. Um, but the fact that it is a list, an instant, makes it worth talking about. Draw three and then discard a card. That's pretty powerful. I just don't know that... I just don't know that four mana, it's worth having this card in your deck. Right. It It's still going to be like... When you see this card, it's going to be like a one-of. Like, it, if, if you go more than a one-of, you're going to be taking those out of your deck. Because... Like, when I, I think about this, I'm like, maybe the blue-black reanimator deck. Um, that's one of those decks where it's a graveyard-based deck, so everything that kind of dumps something in the graveyard, people talk about putting it in there, but then in practice, there's just not enough slots in that deck. Like, yeah. it's already pretty packed, and it's not even a tier one deck, so I think this card is like, well, cool, like, our draw spells have gotten bumped up in power level a little bit, but I, I don't see where it goes. I think they could potentially compete with mystical teachings in alchemy decks if you decide if like if you're playing mystical teachings and you just decide that you just need raw card advantage more than the tutor that mystical teachings is. Mm -hmm. Like you could maybe play one copy of this card, but I just don't know. I just don't feel that like you need you don't need the card advantage in that deck. I don't think, and I would rather have mystical teachings to go get the answer I need at the at the time than just have a random draw three hmm. next we have scour all possibilities it is a colorless and a blue for a sorcery it says scry two then draw card um, it also has flashback for four and a blue so we've doubled the cost on preordain and we've given it flashback i think this card's unplayable which is really sad because so far we've we've gone through a lot of these and we're just ragging on a lot of them the competition in Popper, I think, is just really steep, and we have the other, we have the other cantrip spells. Two is a lot for a cantrip, I think. So I think this, if this was an instant, it could compete with Think Twice. Oh yeah, and it, it might be a good option, but as a sorcery, I don't like this card. Yeah, there's a laundry list of cards that are two mana cantrips, like I think Anticipate and uh telling time like we have a lot of them 
and they just flat never see play and i think for a reason like it's just i know that preordain is supposed to be like the best cantrip in popper and i i'm doubtful that the flashback is gonna feel good that's gonna that's gonna be your turn you're gonna dig a little bit you're gonna get some card advantage but yeah think twice is some steep competition as well so next we have smoke shroud smoke shroud is a colorless and a blue for an enchantment aura it says enchant creature enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and has flying when a ninja enters the battlefield under your control you may return smoke shroud from your graveyard to the battlefield attached to that creature so i think that this is just a really powerful effect and we've gotten a few playable ninjas out of this new set so you can include that with ninja the deep hours and the changelings and maybe there's something there i don't think there there really could be but i think this card is powerful enough on its face that if down the line we do get better ninjas more ninjas i don't know maybe even just putting this on to ninja the deep hours is enough to make it great I think you're going to have to get value for discarding it to the graveyard and then having it come in anyway. Because, like, playing this for two mana... Like, I want this to be free. It's mm -hmm. worth it if it's free and it feels like it's not card disadvantage. Yeah. Other than that... I feel like you could set up some sort of blue-black um, ninjas deck where you're playing, like, the one black changeling that we'll talk about in a minute. There's another black ninja... There's the bad three mana ninja. And and maybe if that's getting an additional plus one plus one, it's a little better. And you could play cards like Thought Scour for the self mill, have cards like Think Twice and Forbidden Alchemy in your deck, where you kind of care about self milling and this is just extra gravy if you can put a couple of these into your graveyard and just make all of your ninjas just incredible threats. I think the big problem I think that we have the cards to make that self mill package in Popper. I think the problem is just it might not the payoff might not be there in the ninjas. Yeah, the the ninjas are you can't just put a, a deck with all ninjas, so they have mm -hmm. to be like you know fifty percent or less of your deck is ninjas, and the rest are like enabler creatures. Yeah, and then you're putting in cards that I think make you want to discard to make this good. I, I do really like that it gives evasion to creatures that really want to hit your opponent. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a card that makes sense in a lot of ways. It's just like, yeah, this is probably going to go straight into some homebrew ninja deck that honestly isn't going to ever see tournament play. Yeah. Maybe one day we'll get some good ninjas. It, they'd have to be pretty good. Ninjas. Okay, so next we've got Winter's Rest. It is a colorless and a blue for a snow enchantment aura. It says enchant creature. When Winter's Rest enters the battlefield, tap enchanted creature. As long as you control another snow permanent, enchanted creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. If you have snow lands, this is a slightly better... Um, what's the hybrid enchantment? Curse of Chains? Curse of Chains, because this taps the creature right away. Mm -hmm. But where this card is going is in my Cancrix mill deck. <laughs> yeah, because it's a snow per snow enchantment. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of funny, but... Mm, doubtful. Nope. Cancrix I... mill, tier one. Speaking of mill, our next card is Stream of Thought. It is a single blue... This is also going in my Cancrix mill deck. For a sorcery, it says target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard. You shuffle up to four cards from your graveyard into your library. Replicate four. The art so, is really funny on this. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really cool. So what I do like about this is that it says target player. So you can mill yourself and then shuffle the cards you want in back into your deck back in. So it's just like turning your it's it's kind of like the what's the what was the counter spell? Mill put four cards back in. Oh, devious cover up. It sort of reminds me of devious cover up, of just like you mill out you you mill your you start milling your deck, and then putting back the spells that you would want to draw, 
and just like filtering out a lot of the nonsense. It can't immediately put itself back into your library. No, but it can it can put it can if you replicate it. No, the last one that resolves is the actual card. So it, the card's not in the graveyard until the last one resolves, right? Okay, yeah, I think you're right. For some reason I was thinking that you could just put the car, resolve the cards in any order you wanted. Uh, Cuz they're all not. they're all going onto the stack at the same time. It's kind of like storm. I was always res- I was always under the impression that you could order that because they're all going onto the stack at the same time. No, it goes on the stack, the ability triggers, all of those things go on the stack, all yeah, the triggered abilities resolve. Yeah, Storm, but this isn't Storm. Yeah, but Replicate works in the same way of when it, it's cast, the Replicate triggers go on the stack. Oh, I thought Replicate was part of casting it. Like, you would pay the Replicate cost as you cast the spell. You do... It's just that's how it works of like, on at least on MTGO, the card is on the stack and it has this triggered MTGO ability to replicate. Stupid. We already knew that. I don't believe it. Okay. Ir- irrelevant. Even if it did, I don't think that would push it either way. I don't know. What, what, what am I doing with stream of thought? Milling my opponent? No, you're mm-hmm. milling yourself. <laughs> that seems so silly. Does it though? Yeah. You make your so potent. You mill all these lands and then shuffle all these spells back in. That's gas. Or you could play, like, Preordain. You could play all of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Next, we have String of Disappearances. It is a single blue for an instant. It says, return target creature to its owner's hand. Then that creature's controller may pay blue-blue. If the player does, they, they may copy the spell and may choose a new target for that copy. So when I saw this, the first thing I thought of was, I want to bounce my own spell stutter sprite with this. And then I can replicate it to bounce my opponent's creature or bounce another spell stutter sprite as just kind of like a value play that saves your guy and has has gravy. Because like I was interested that if you target your own creature, you can pay the blue blue to replicate it. Can't you also do the same thing with chain lightning? Mm, you chain just lightning. Want to, or is chain lightning worded differently? It's worded different where it's your opponent always gets t- to do the red red first. Oh, interesting Mm -hmm. the only thing the only reason i say that is kind of because uh the mono blue control deck that with just spire golems and spell setter sprites plays i don't remember what it's called aether burst or something whatever the one it it returns a creature to its owner's hand and then for every copy of that same spell in the graveyard it bounces another creature and it kind of uses that as like a well the first time i just saved my creature the second time i saved my creature and bounce one of your guys and then just keep doing that string of dis- disappearances kind of does the same thing i don't know hmm. it's expensive though yeah all right should we talk about the black cards oh yes okay our first one is azra smoke shaper three and a black for a three three azra ninja it's an azra what the heck is an azra I don't know, but I'm excited for Azra Tribal. It has Ninjutsu for one black. When Azra Smoke Shaper enters the battlefield, target creature you control gains indestructible until the end of turn. Mm, it seems like kind of real. Well, I guess it matters. You can save a creature that's being blocked or something. I was thinking about a removal spell. Um, and if if you have any ninjas in your deck, I don't think that your opponent is playing removal on the blockers or after the blockers step. The way I see the ninjutsu cost on this creature is to get an undercost at 3-3 into play. And, like, maybe sometimes you'll be able to eat another creature in combat. Like, I don't know, if you have a Delver and they block with their core Skyfisher, and then you ninjutsu whatever and put this into play and make your Delver indestructible. Yeah. That's a thing that could happen, but I really just see the ninjutsu cost as a way to put a 3-3 into play. Like, if you go, like, turn one, one drop, turn two, attack them for three. I mean, it's it's funny to say that it's under-costed, because the creature you're ninjutsuing back costs at least one, so it, yeah. it's minimum three mana, three, three. But it's probably a, a weird ability. That you're fine putting back into your hand, so... Yeah. yeah. You'd rather those cards be in your hand anyway, so... It is weird. To me, it's weird that they put ninjutsu in this set, isn't it? Um, not really. I mean, they put every mechanic in this set, so... Uh, I think ninjutsu would just be left out. 
if they didn't put it in there. It would just be weird. Like, why isn't ninjutsu in this set? Unearth, delve, convoke, hellbent, menace. Or I guess menace is evergreen. Evolve, changeling, exalted, replicate, flashback. Everything's in this set. If spell mastery, yeah. Spell mastery's in this set. Yeah, we're, I'm just looking at the commons. I don't even know what other crazy mechanics are in the <laughs> uncommon and rare slots. Nectard? Yes. Changeling Outcast. One one black mana for a 1-1 one, one changeling. It's a shapeshifter. So it's a shapeshifter. It has the ability changeling. Changeling Outcast can't block and can't be blocked. This goes in that ninja tribal deck we were talking about. I mean, yes. You make you make a two two unblockable, and then when you ninjutsu in your creature, your enchantment goes to the graveyard and then comes onto the creature that you just ninjutsued in. Yeah. Yeah, I broke it. <laughs> I mean, it. This has potential. Like we've talked about it in the fairy, the fairy deck, uh, in previous weeks, and yeah. we think that that's a base blue deck and making your one drop. A black card is a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. Any any kind of tribal deck you're gonna put in black, this is a potential card, but it really has to want to hit your opponent. So that's why uh, I didn't I think make our top fives or anything. Yeah, but super high on this card. Um, next card, first sphere, gargantua, four black black for a five four horror. When First Sphere Gargantua enters the battlefield, you draw a card and lose one life. So on its surface, six mana for a 5-4 that draws a card at the cost of a life, I don't think is playable. Right. But this card has Unearth for two and a black. I Yeah, the Unearth half is really what catches my attention at all with this card. I want to really, really like it, but... That six mana on the front and then having to work so hard for like a five four attacker for one turn that draws you a card. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of hoops to draw to jump through. Yeah, I think the other big problem with this card is it doesn't have a way to put itself in the graveyard. Like yeah. if you draw this card, it's just stuck in your hand unless you're pairing it with cards like Faithless Looting or uh, Careful Study if you're playing like blue. Or like self mill if you're doing like black green, but you can't just get rid of this card on its own. You've got to discard it to something, and then unearth it to get any sort of payoff out of it. Yeah. Next card, gluttonous slug, which this card kind of bothers me, like as a flavor <laughs> fail. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. It's a one two. It's a one and a black for a zero three with menace and evolve. So Evolve says whenever a creature that is bigger than the slug enters the battlefield, you put a plus one, plus one counter onto the creature. So why would a gluttonous slug, because like the name gluttonous slug implies that like it's eating stuff from its surroundings to get bigger. Yeah. But then it's getting bigger by your other things coming into play. You know, it's not like you like when a creature comes into play, sacrifice it, put a counter on gluttonous slug. Yeah. I don't know. I think this name makes sense, and therefore, I don't like this card. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the heck I'm going to be doing with it. So, I'm I'm fine. Moving on. Mob. Four and a black for an instant. It has Convoke. So, again, your creatures can help you cast this spell. They can help you. <laughs> Destroy target creature is what they can help you do. I mean, it's instant. It has Convoke. Five is a lot, though. Five is a lot. Yeah. One thing that I think about when some when they print Convoke cards is, do you think there's ever going to be a deck that's like, it's mono green, but some of the creatures have split costs? So they just pay green for their creatures, but those are the only sources of black that they're using, and they can use them to cast, like, Mob? Like Slitherheads or something? Yeah. It's possible. Uh, it's possible. I don't think it's very good, but I think that it's a cool idea for a deck. I think that a good place where this card could go is sideboards for elf decks. If there was ever a problematic creature they need to kill, 
because the elf deck elf decks are pretty good at generating any color of mana and having enough creatures to convoke this. I just don't know that there's ever a creature in this format that like the elf deck has to get off the field. Like there there's yeah. not really any like prison type creatures or like you know there's cards in other formats that say like creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger etc or like activated ability of target creature whatever like stuff like that just doesn't really exist too much i guess like the biggest one is this could kill standard bearer but yeah, gut, why gut shot you, can yeah gut shot in your sideboard yeah and so it's like just much better at doing what you're trying to do with this yeah black just doesn't have enough creatures that can convoke a spell and then the last black card you want to read Yep, this is Ransack the Lab. One in a black for a sorcery. Look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest into your graveyard. So it's kind of like a black Anticipate, except I don't think Anticipate puts the cards in your graveyard. Yeah, there's there are spells in black that do something similar to this, and then they get a, specifically a creature from those cards into your hand. I really like that this is any card, so you mm -hmm. can look for a removal spell or something like that, and then it dumps the rest in the graveyard. I think this is maybe one of the best cards in black that was printed in this set, but two mana cantrips are historically not that good, unless it's like commune with the gods or something like that, and I don't think this is on the same power level. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the red cards. Okay. Uh, First red card, we have... Bladeback Sliver. It is a colorless and a red for a 2-2 Sliver. It has Hellbent. As long as you have no cards in hand, Sliver creatures you control have Tap. This creature deals 1 damage to target player or planeswalker. So I think that this ability is strong on its own as a way to like play around cards like Moment's Peace. You know, you don't really ever have to attack. You have like a new way of like Basically, you can attack with the creatures that you want to attack with, and then when they flash back the moments piece, you can tap the rest of your creatures to punch them for damage, etc. Um, you can get through if they just have a bigger board. I think the problem here is being hellbent. I don't know if that's a problem. I, I think the know. biggest problem is that it's red, and the sliver decks aren't red right now. Maybe I don't think the hellbent is that big of a deal, because mm. you'll get there really see the mana restriction as being much of a problem either hmm. i don't think it would be difficult to like adjust your mana base to fit something like this i would just be worried about like just having a 2-2 that does nothing if you have a card in your hand that you can't get rid of <laughs> yeah so next up we have fists of flame it is a colorless and a red for an instant it says draw a card until end of turn target creature gets trample and gets plus one plus zero for each card you've drawn this turn and is that so it it has that and if you draw more cards it goes up even like after this is already resolved right i don't know huh well i hope it works that way um because that would be pretty sick um it does for sure at least give plus one plus oh and trample it's an instant i think this is gonna be pretty cool in mono red blitz or normal is it blitz you don't think this card is competing for the slot with teamer battle rage i think it is competing with the slot that is true i guess i hadn't considered that but because i just don't see hmm. this card fitting into decks just because teamer battle rage exists but i don't know maybe you want more battle rage effects and you include a couple copies of this as well and then you just don't feel bad about casting this and like getting in for a smaller combo turn yeah maybe hmm. i i think it is funny that they spoiled they spoiled this the same day that they banned gataxian probe and gush <laughs> <laughs> i think there are combos that you can do with this like there's ways to draw just tons of cards and then like like whirlpool rider i think like brainstorm i guess um for not a lot of mana you can really draw like 10 cards even though if they don't stay in your hand i don't know i i think it's a cool little combo piece that might pop up i really like that it gives trample yeah the trample bit makes this card 
playable. It's just a question of whether, for me, whether it can fit into the decks that would want this because they're already including Team or Battle Rage. I mean, I don't know. I could be wrong, but I would just feel like if you're playing any number of this, it's after you're already playing for Battle Rage. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, uh, next we have Geomancer's Gambit. It is two and a red for a sorcery. It says destroy target land. Its controller may search their library for a basic land, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle their library, draw a card. I this I see this as more of like a sleeper and a, like a just in case if if Tron ever gets too powerful, if Tron ever hits, you know the the number one spot it has more than 60 points red decks can start putting geomancer's gambit in there and i really don't think that they ever want to put a basic land in their deck like most of them don't and if it is they're putting like one in there and then you just blow up a land draw a card and you're really far ahead of that that tron player and even if it never sees any play it's just like a backup plan in case, you know, in case that ever happens. It's it's totally a sideboard card, in my opinion, though. Yeah, I even think this card is great against decks that have basics. Um, you know, if you're bringing in your Molten Rains against decks that are playing Bounce Lands to slow them down, I think that this card is just as good. It, like, I don't know. It, it replaces itself. It kills that Bounce Land. Yeah. You know, like it's... it's puts them behind one mana yeah i think this this does have its like specific decks it's very good against mm -hmm. and you know, other decks i think it could be like really really good against you know but it's not quite as versatile as just like straight up molten rain but i love it i love this card a lot i see myself playing it at some point next we have goblin champion it is a single red for a zero one goblin warrior it has haste and exalted so first turn it comes out, it's either a 1-2 that's attacking or something else gets a buff. I mean, it does have haste. Yeah, I mean, it's a hasty one drop. Uh, it's a goblin. I mean, I know there are a lot of people who like playing around with goblin tribal in this format. I've thought about this card in burn decks, and I don't think it's more powerful than G2 Lava Runner, hmm. but maybe it is without Gitaxium Probe. Because, you know, this card does attack on turn one. Uh, it powers up your other attackers. Not to mention if you have other goblin champions out, this just becomes, you know, a just a powerhouse threat that can just punch through so many other things. It can be electricaried, and that's a pretty big point against it. I want to say I'm, I'm pretty low on this card. Interesting. Okay. I think it's... I think it's close. Like I think it's in the conversation with the uh, lava runner. I don't. I don't feel like it's close. But anything else before we go to Goblin War Party? Nope. Goblin War Party is three and a red for a sorcery. It says choose one, create three one one goblin creature tokens, or creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain haste until end of turn, and you can pay its entwine cost for two and a red. Seems doubtful that you're doing both, but it would put six power of hasty creatures on the field if you did. Uh, would it? It would just put... Oh, yeah, yeah, six power. I thought you said six hasty creatures. And I was like, what? <laughs> so there's actually a brew that I've seen float around. It's cr like Cranko's Command. Are you talking that... Goblin Storm? Yeah, that like generates tons of red mana while it's generating tons of goblin tokens. And then you goblin war party and entwine it. You make the three extra one ones and then give all your creatures plus one plus one in haste. It's just like you play like one or two copies of this alongside your bushwhackers and stuff. It's just like extra ways to generate tokens and, you know, kill your opponent. It's like when you can't use it to kill with, you're just using it to further your game plan of making goblin tokens. And then sometimes it's just like you just can generate seven mana and then you just kill your opponent. Huh, that's interesting. I wasn't thinking about that, and that is a use case. And the they do play Goblin Electromancer to make it cost less in a lot of those brews. 
Mm-hmm. So it could you could end up paying only like six or five for this and have it really punch your opponent for a lot of damage. Yeah. So again, probably not going into anything tier one, but there are some fun uh, uses for this card in existing decks. Yeah. Next, we have a card that almost made my top five. We've got Orcish Hellraiser. It is a colorless and a red for a 3-2 Orc Warrior. It has Echo 1, and when Orcish Hellraiser dies, it deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. We had a conversation about this on Twitter. The The conversation was basically like somebody's saying um, that this could be better than Keldon Marauders. I think the person asked if this was an auto occlude and burn, and oh, okay. I asked if this was better or worse than Kelden Marauders. Right, that you have a better memory than I do. Yeah, there are a couple things like there are the, there are obviously like similarities, but then there are obvious differences too with both of these cards. And the way you explained it, and I'm just going to let you explain it, makes a ton of sense why this card is just better than Kelden Marauders in a lot of cases. So I think that the echo cost is worth it for the higher ceiling of uh, you're, you can have a creature that sticks around and demands an answer and they can't just throw a single throwaway creature like a 1-1 one, one in front of this and have it just uh, go away on its own. They have to actually deal with this, sacrifice something tangible. Uh, it still has, it's a little bit slower on the front end of like, it's not going to do the one damage that Kelden Marauders does, but if you really need it to do two damage right away, you can just not pay the echo cost and push that damage through. So I think it has a higher ceiling. It blocks just as well as Kelden Marauders. Uh, Kelden Marauders, it doesn't matter if it yeah. has an extra toughness, it's because it's going to die anyway. So I this is... Like- only case where it matters is when you're playing against core sky fisher but i think that's literally the only creature in this format where a three three is just strictly better than a three two i don't almost... even think it's better in that case because i think the only time you're blocking is when you play the creature and then for a turn you get to block and core sky fisher just flies over i mean they you... block with a core sky fisher and trades with this whereas yeah. Kill the Marauders would just eat the core Skyfisher. And then die the following turn, and it's all the same. Oh, yeah, I guess that's fair. Yeah, so I I think most of the benefits I would see around Kill the Marauders, Orcish Hellraiser kind of has, like, clever ways around it where it's mostly the same. Mm-hmm. So I think that this is better. I really do think that this is better. That's a card that's played in most burn sideboards, so this actually goes in a deck that's good. So I I think it's one of the best cards in the set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's just like a strict upgrade for an already tier, you know, tier one deck in the format. Yeah. And then our last red card is Shenanigans. It is a colorless and a red for a sorcery. It says destroy target artifact, and it has Dredge one. If I ever got a cat and it was named and it was a, a girl, I was gonna name it Shenanigans. I'm just call it Shan for short. That's really relevant to the set review. I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> I think it's just a really powerful sideboard card in general. I think that it's better than a card like Smash to Smithereens. Uh, it's just like a, a recursive source of removal when you really need to be killing artifacts. If you're playing against like Affinity, this isn't just like a one time destroy an artifact. This is just like a continual source that they're never going to be able to burn through. You're just going to every turn kill one of their, one of their artifacts. And it does say artifacts. So this can just like blow up their lands. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's something like burn. You still want smash to smithereens over this just because the speed is more important, I think. But I think there is an argument to be made for a lot of decks where, you can just blow up a land every turn, and as soon as they hit a, miss a land drop, they're just out of the game. Mm-hmm. And this can also blow up the creatures if you're a little bit behind. So you want the dredge to be as low as possible on this, so you don't like deck yourself or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, that's why I love that it's dredge one. Like I would trade a random card on top of my library for this 
against affinity every single time. Yeah. You're just going to end up with, this is in your hand. You don't have any artifacts to blow up anymore. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'll just top deck something at this point and just kill my opponent. Yeah. Yeah, I think that with the exception of burn, because you're right, you do want you do want that velocity, you do want that extra damage from Smash to Smithereens. I think in any other red deck, you should just have shenanigans if you are looking for... Like, there is a couple players at the local store that play affinity decks. I will probably put a copy of this in my scred sideboards. Hmm. And it, you know, it's, it sucks that it does compete with Mox Monkey, but I think that this can yeah. compete as like, they're both, they're both ways that so, blow up artifacts. It's just that yeah. this one very late game is, uh, can, can blow up a creature and catch you up that way. Right. Mox Monkey is just good if you're in the business of killing their lands, but it's so hard to kill other creatures, like other artifacts in general especially out of affinity like mox monkey's never going to kill a mer enforcer well it says non-creature artifact so yeah it's never going to oh, kill any creature yeah oh gorilla shaman's just a bad card <laughs> really it in your deck okay I gorilla shaman's I not a bad card i don't think i've ever even cast a gorilla shaman in my whole <laughs> life yeah cards unplayable just play shenanigans <laughs> i mean shenanigans they can't just kill it but Mox Monkey, you can act, you can be like turn five and be like, oh, there it is. Play it, blow up four of your lands. Even yeah. if you have Atog, you don't have enough artifacts to blow up yeah. now. I mean, if you're behind on the board, though, that... Yeah. It's still like... I don't know how great that is. I don't know. I actually might just believe Shenanigans is better than Gorilla Shaman. Uh, yeah, there's everything a... except Mass Land Destruction. Yeah. I think that's fair, and shenanigans is pretty respectable. So, ready to move on to green? Yeah. So our first green card is Elvish Fury. It is a single green for an instant that says target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn, and it has buyback four. I know that Kendra Smith, the Maverick Girl, she was excited about this card in Elves. I don't really see it, but also I am not the magic mind that she is so maybe i'll just wait for her to show me yeah that's i think i didn't know that she was excited about it and i was very maybe i'm wrong excited. i feel like i saw her tweeting about elvish fury maybe i'm just maybe i'm just remembering wrong what she had talked oh about. she this card she's speaking about the storm card i i saw that tweet i saw the tweet about the storm card too but oh, okay there, Elvish Fury was one of the first commons uh, spoiled, and I remember she made a tweet about it. Maybe I'm just misremembering the context of her tweet. Huh. I don't know. Anyway, I would never put this into an elf deck. Me neither. Next card. Oh, I thought this card said time. It's Rhyme Tender. One and a green for a 2-2 human druid. It's a snow creature. It has tap to untap another target snow permanent. I think this suffers from you really want to untap uh bounce lands with mm -hmm. your creature that untaps stuff. I like that it's a bear, like it's a 2/2 two, two for 2 um so that it can like change modes into being like a card that can beat down your opponent and block pretty decently. Yeah. Um cuz before we only had like a 1/2 one, two for 2 and then Arbor Elf, it's a 1/1 one, one for 1. So I think the body got an upgrade here, but the ability got a downgrade. Um, yes and no, because we're not just looking at tapping lands. It can untap other snow creatures. Um, isn't, what's that one blue mana spell? It's like an instant. Your creature gets the ability till the end of turn tap to bounce a creature or something to their hand. Oh, it's retraction helix. Retraction Helix. That's a common, right? Yes. Like you could Retraction Helix, a, t a Rhyme Render, a Rhyme Tender, and if you had two other Rhyme Tenders, you could go Infinite and bounce all their things. I infinite? Yeah. You could bounce. Right? Because you're. Three of their things. Well, no, because you always use. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, this card sucks. <laughs> <laughs> what's the 
the next one? <laughs> Savage Swipe. Single green mana sorcery. Target creature you control gets plus two, plus two until end of turn if its power is two. Then it fights target creature you don't control. I I like this card. Even if your creature is a, a big boy and is like a 5-5 five five, and you want fights. to use it to fight, it still fights. And they can't Even, like mutagenic. Yeah. They can't mutagenic your guy to like fizzle this or anything. So that, that's like, that works. And then there are a lot of 2-2s. Two and I really like that this can, like, if you have a, a 2 2 guy, you can pump it up to a 4 4, kill their guy, and then attack for 4. And it's just so cheap to do it. I really like it. How does this compare with the other fight spell um, in the format? Um, Epic, Epic Confrontation? I think that this is better. I really do. The only case that it's worse is. If you're using it on a 1-1, one, one, like you're having your 1-1 one, one fight something else, uh, I yeah. think that the trade-off is worth it to decrease the mana cost by 1. Next card, Spring Bloom Druid. 2 and a green for a 1-1 one, one Elf Druid. When Spring Bloom Druid enters the battlefield, sacrifice a land. If you do, search your library for two basic lands and put them onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. So, I mean, it's just a 3-mana ramp spell. They glued a 1-1 one, one to Harrow. Yes. I don't think it's very good. Nope. I'm excited for the next card, though. Tree Folk Umbra. Two and a green for an enchantment aura. Enchanted creature gets plus zero, plus two, and assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power, and it has totem armor. So what's this called? Butt Fight. Butt Fight. So I believe there's an anime about this. <laughs> I've never seen it, but I've heard about it. <laughs> it's the one where they're playing like beach volleyball. I don't know. I think it's just like they literally have wars with their butts. Oh. Tournaments, like, but they're only allowed to hit each other with their butts. So somebody write in. Somebody tweet us. <laughs> Some, just <laughs> really, there's someone who actually knows the plot of this anime. Actually, don't. I don't know that I even want to know. I know that it. <laughs> That's enough for me. Yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at. Don't think I'll ever watch that. And I watch a lot of anime. <laughs> anyway, Tree Folk Umbra. This is the first time we've gotten the butt, butt fight feet. mechanic in Popper. So that I'm really, really excited for. And there's a lot of powerful spells that buff toughness in this format. Um, whatever the one green mana to give spider something plus, plus zero plus five spider silk armor. Yeah. So, I mean, I heard someone say Tireless Tribe. I don't think... I. What do you think? You played that deck more than me. You don't ever have to switch its power and toughness, and its toughness is just going to be gigantic. Yeah, I think that this has got legs. Um, Totem Armor adds an extra bit of protection, as long as you can resolve it. Um, definitely don't think it's as powerful as... You know the version that was playing the most broken spell in the format, but I think that's got potential. I'm excited about about that. I hadn't thought about it, but I think that I I'm excited about it. It does sound like it would feel pretty good to put on your heroic creature that returns stuff. What about uh, your Lona Tethos Band Trailblazer? Your <laughs> Zero Four. Make it a make it a one seven. <laughs> what fight? That that does sound like a pretty huge creature. Um, I'm I'm a little disappointed that this doesn't give reach. I would usually assume that a tree folk umbra would give reach, but um, we'll settle for fight. He will settle for butt fight. But I I've been looking for them to add this mechanic to popper for a long time. I wish it was like more of a broad thing of like it gave all of your creatures that or something like that. But we'll take it. And totem armor is a very good mechanic. Trumpeting Herd is our next card. Two green green for a sorcery. Create a 3-3 three, three green elephant creature token. Rebound. So four mana, create two 3-3 three, three tokens. And you create the second one a little bit slower, but um, I'm not sure. I Again, I'm not sure what this is going into. Yeah. Uh, on, on rate, this is a really powerful card. Like six power, 
over two different bodies for four mana is pretty good. Yeah. I don't know if this fits anywhere or what this card's doing, where it would go. I don't know. I think I'm exactly where you're at of like, whoa, that seems like a good freight. All of the all of my usual checks are there except for, and it goes in. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Last green card, uh, Weather the Storm, one and a green for an instant that says you gain three life, and it has Storm. That's a good card. Um, is it better than Luminescent Rain, which is the choose, choose the creature type, gain two life for each card of that type, I think, or gain a life for each card of that type? Gain two life for each, for each permanent you control of that type. I want to say that it is. Okay. It's it's better when you don't have any permanents in play. Um, I guess that's that's true too. It it gives you gives you the option of at least gaining you like six life against a burn deck if they've managed to searing blaze all your elves, which they are want to do. Yeah, uh, like leave two mana untapped. Wait for your opponent to like okay, bolt you, bolt you, fire blast, and then you're just like. Weather the, weather the storm for 12 like i think that pretty frequently this is going to be gaining a lot of life and it has the potential to just gain so much life that you you just win cool i'm convinced hopefully i open a couple foils next week at the pre-release okay and then I will take the last of the honorable mentions. We have Universal Automaton. It is a colorless mana for a 1-1 one, one artifact creature shapeshifter. It has changeling and, that's and flavor it. text. <laughs> this card gets an honorable mention because if you feel like you need more of the generic sliver, what's his name? Metallic sliver? Metallic sliver. If you think you need more metallic slivers, here you go. If you think you need more one one fairies, here you go. Here's a really bad one that doesn't have flying. <laughs> I yeah. guess that if you're playing a tribal deck and you just are wanting for one drops, this is one drop for your tribal deck and it goes into any deck. This is colorless. Yeah, that, I mean not exciting. It's it's pure potential, but no actual like it's going to be one of the worst cards in everything that it goes in, but it just has so many decks that it could potentially go in that it's like, well, throw it on the list. You might sure. see it pop up. Yep. I would never play this card, though. <laughs> yeah, you're, the, the, the archetype you've chosen does not have enough cards to actually be supported at that point. Right. Just maybe choose a different archetype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Should we do our top five? So I'm going to do my number five first. Uh, it is Arkham's Astrolabe. It is a one snow mana for a snow artifact. When Arkham's Astrolabe enters the battlefield, draw a card and you can filter a mana through it. So I don't think this is going into anything that exists right now. Uh, so that's that's minus points. That's why it's not like number... like If, if this just went into Scred Delver and you know, Monarch or Boros Monarch, this would be like the number one card. I love that it's only one mana for this effect. Um, mm -hmm. I think this might have a home in like in a th three color decks. It makes three color decks way more playable, especially if they want to cast Scred. Uh, this, this counts as a snow permanent for that spell and it can filter a mana the turn that it comes out. So just a lot of good things happening here. What do you think about this card? I think this card's really, really good. It's, in some cases, just like a strict upgrade to Prophetic Prism in that it costs one less mana. It is a snow artifact, so it powers up Screds, but it costs snow mana to cast, which is really restrictive, like you said, on what decks it goes into. I don't think that this card can go into Boros Monarch. I just don't think that they play right. enough basics to support it. Um, I don't think this card goes into Scred Delver. Maybe this card goes into like a Scredless or like a Delverless Scred deck. Hmm. Like maybe I just, I would never put this into a deck with Delver of Secrets. Right. 
It does suffer from, like, we don't know where it goes yet, but it does enable some really powerful things. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my number five is Treetop Ambusher. It is one in a green for a 2-1 Elf Berserker. It says when Treetop Ambusher attacks, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until the end of turn, and it has dash for one in a green. So I can envision scenarios where you can play this card in like a Stompy deck. Um, if you play a one drop into this card, or like heaven forbid, you can even dash this off of Burning Tree Emissary's mana. You can you can realistically hit for four, potentially five, if your one drop was a young wolf on turn two. Um, hmm. I think that this is a really aggressive creature. I think it's really strong, but I'm I'm not also not like super versed in like the Stompy deck, so I'm unsure if this just is better than anything that's already in the deck list. Yeah, that's that's the big part where I was like racking my brain to think like what I would take out, and that does seem tough. I do like that it's it can pump itself up to kind of negate the one toughness if there's like a an auger of bolas on the field, and that mm -hmm. deck does struggle against that card, so it could yeah. be attacking for three on turn two. I don't know if that deck is very excited about having to play pay the mana over and over, but you do always have the option of just paying two mana for it, having it stick around, and then attacking the next turn. Yeah. It's not as relevant in this format because there's not really many sweepers, but dashing creatures is actually really strong against decks that have that rely on sorcery speed removal or sweepers. Um, so like Evancar's Justice, this card is great against that deck, or like that card. This card's also really good against Journey to Nowhere. Hmm, yeah. I, I I think it has more potential than I originally thought. This wasn't on my list at all. <clears throat> I just don't know if it has a slot, so I guess we'll see on that one. Yeah, that's the only thing is I don't I don't know if there's a card worse than this in the Stompy deck currently. My initial this... thought would be like Nest Invader, but I think that making the creature to protect you from edicts, making that that Scion token or whatever it makes. Spawn. The Eldrazi spawn. spawn. Eldrazi spawn. That just might be the better card. I think and I think that it is, but I think that like if this card was gonna compete with a spot, it would be Nest Invader. And I don't think this card's better than Nest Invader. Right. I I think that also Nest Invader's ability to you you're at three or you're at two mana, you need to get to three to play your elephant guide or something. Yeah. And use that spawn again so hmm, maybe maybe it'll find a home somewhere uh it is an elf so who elves always have weird applications cool um, right, number four. and we have a shared number four it is oh, winding yep. yeah it's winding way it is a colorless and a green for a sorcery it says choose creature or land reveal the top four cards of your library put all cards of the chosen type revealed this way into your hand and the rest into the graveyard this is a mini uh lead the stampede mm -hmm. shaving one card for one mana potentially better rate than lead the stampede too it is it definitely is like if you hit four off this for two mana i think that's certainly better than five for three the only part that the rate isn't better is like you're spending one card in your hand to draw up to four cards mm -hmm. uh I think that my plans with this card is to cut Distant Melody from my deck, take the island out of my deck, get rid of the Sylvan Rangers, put four land grants into my deck, and then two copies of this alongside four copies of... of uh, Lead the Stampede? Lead the Stampede. I think that's respectable. A lot of people do want to get that green, that blue out of their deck. And just like do something a little bit more reasonable where they're not drawing 12 cards in a turn, but really smoothing out their deck of like, you don't have to play the the two mana guy that just goes and gets you a land, mm -hmm. which is like a terrible rate on a card. You yes. don't have weird draws where you just have an island that doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And this is just still a very powerful spell. Yeah. And I think that like, like at first, like I was thinking about it and like, maybe it's unintuitive to have land grant because that just is more like misses but you're also getting to cut down your land count and when you are able to cast land grant you're just getting lands out of your deck so your deck is becoming more potent 
more just full of hits for when mm -hmm. you cast this card and when you cast um, lead the stampede. So that's the I first have... thing I'm going to do is I'm going to test this in elves, mm -hmm. this just mono green version of the deck. Yeah, I, I think that that is going to pay off for you. And I've been a fan of the land grant version for a while, like giving your opponent the information of what's in your hand doesn't really seem to matter that much in my opinion. And I know that the statistics on on thinning your deck of lands is like it's not very impactful it's like a matter of like one percent or something like that but when that one percent comes into effect every time you draw a card and then every time you cast a winding way or lead the lead the stampede that can kind of compound of like you do check a lot how what the statistics on your deck are um and i i think that pays off so another thing that i do like about winding way though is even if you do hit like a couple of stinkers you're putting them in your graveyard. So it means oh, heck your, yeah. your next winding way and your next lead the stampede is just that much better. Yeah, you don't throw them on the bottom, which I guess I kind of overlooked uh, when I was first talking about this card. But I think when I was reading about it on the Reddit that, you know, other people didn't overlook of like, wow, this is... I don't think anybody's ever really trying to look for land with this card, but... It's just got that added versatility. It just has so many things, like different angles oh, that yeah. it just is I like... I didn't even like, think about this outside of an elf deck, where you're like, this is just like a better mulch sometimes. Oh, yeah. You no, know, because you go like, okay, well, I need lands, so I'm going to mulch. And you're like, this time around, like, no, I'd rather just get like a good creature, so I'm going to choose creatures. It just like adds options to deck this, decks that are already playing cards like mulch. I didn't even like think about that. I saw this card and immediately it was just like elves, sweet. Put it in my <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. It's a very good card. Um, uh, you ready for number three? Yes. My number three is Defile. It is a single black for an instant. It says target creature gets minus one minus one until end of turn for each swamp you control. This can be just super powerful in a mono black deck. I think that this just goes straight into mono black. Um, I'm excited about it for corrupt control of just this the scaling on this card is just it's gonna be huge uh, I don't know like I, I just want as many cards that say for the number of swamps you control and <laughs> it, it, like it's pretty quick that this scales as like turn two this is as big as a disfigure yeah. first turn I guess is the only turn that this is gonna be worse unless you you're playing like a baron more or something like that and then after that it's just like Minus three, minus three for one mana. I would play that. Mm -hmm. Minus four or minus five for one mana. I'm just over the moon. Just so so excited about it. How many swamps do you think have to be in your deck for you to play this card over Disfigure? Because I'm thinking of ways to try to make the mana base work for like Blue Black Alchemy and play this over Disfigures. Obviously, that gets problematic when you've got Bajuka Bog. Uh, dismal backwaters, Demir aqueducts, etc. So, how many? What? What do you think is like the minimum swamps you need in a deck to play Defile? Like six? I think you need a lot. Like, I think you need to be a base black deck of like over fifty percent swamps. Mm. Like, I don't want there to be incentive for me to play a different color mana so I can play a different spell and then kind of just be wishing that I had more swamps in play at some later date yeah I, I think that you really need to have a lot of swamps in your deck i could be wrong and you know maybe See, if you I have even, a i even think that if you just have like one in the early game like the difference between one and two in our format we've talked about before is not huge there's just not a lot of x2s that you really care about that you know they're it's we're either looking at like x1s or x3s and so even if you've just got the one, the difference between this and Disfigure, I don't think is very, is not very high. But then if you could ever get this to three, it's already just a strict upgrade over, over Disfigure. I'm, I'm, I guess if you made the mana base in blue, black alchemy, uh, like a lot, like you're taking out all of your dismal backwaters and you're trying to put in uh, terramorphic expanses and ash barons type yeah. of deal. Like, then I'm, like, thinking about it, but I still don't like that you're playing the Bounce Land where you could be going down to... Well, what if you cut the Bounce Land and play Dismal Backwaters? I... Uh... You put Urquhart in 
from your deck. Problem solved. <laughs> oh, sweet. That would be so cool. But now, this card I think will actually be like really, really good in modern mono black decks because they have Urborg. And they also just have a ton of swamps, so I'm not excited to this about this after or outside of mono black decks, but within mono black decks it's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. That that's where I'm at. I I don't I'm not really thinking about it outside of that. So I think okay. it's just too much like math and moving pieces to try to to try to rely on this card. Okay. Uh, my number three is Magmatic Sinkhole. It is five and a red. Magmatic Sinkhole deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker, and it has delve. So I relate this a little bit in my mind. It's a little worse than, uh, maybe it's a lot worse than Scred. Maybe not much worse than Scred, just because you do have to have those five cards. But, you know, this format, it's not hard to get cards in your graveyard. And once you can delve it, I think that this is just a good option for red decks that can't afford to fill their deck with snow snow basic lands. So it, it's le- a lot less restrictive on your mana base, which means you can you know put it theoretically in a lot more decks. And it's just a really powerful removal spell for potentially one mana. I've seen this compared to Harvest Pyre. With five cards in your graveyard, Harvest Pyre costs one extra mana, does mm-hmm. the same amount of damage. Um, at one, at four cards in your graveyard, they both cost the same, but Magmatic Sinkhole is doing an extra one. But then Harvest Pyre can also scale, so that would be relevant for things like Atog and Gear, Gear Seeker Serpent. There's really not a lot of creatures with more than that amount of toughness outside of those decks. I guess Heroic might, mm-hmm. but it's so similar to that other card. That's why I didn't make my top five. It does kill Grimog top, Angler. It made my top five because it is similar to Harvest Pyre. And Harvest Pyre is already an incredibly powerful and playable spell. So why would not this make my list? Yeah, it's fair. I think also the fact that you can pay mana for it if there's not that amount of cards in your graveyard makes this maybe a little bit more powerful. Maybe a little bit more powerful than Harvest Pyre in most practical situations. Yeah, it, I mean, I think potentially it could be. Again, I, th- I think what's great about this card is it just gives another powerful removal spell and it's not restrictive like scred is on what a deck can be doing with its mana base okay um for number two i have cave of temptation it is a land you can tap it for a colorless you can tap it for a colorless mana you can also filter a mana through it and you can also pay four tap it sacrifice it and put two plus one plus one counters on target creature activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery the reason this makes it all the way up to my number two is because this gets slotted straight into Tron decks. This is just a strict, strictly better um, Unknown Shores type effect, um, where they were playing Unknown Shores, which is the same card, except without the ability to sacrifice, put counters on things. I know that Tron doesn't want to sacrifice its colored sources that much, but it's just extra options. Like, I just want a four mana or i just want a four four mole drifter attacking my opponent or i want a six six dinrova horror okay time to turn on the gas pop two of these i mean they can pay eight and then pop two of these no problem and then just make a giant creature that attacks their opponent and it's just like they're getting that ability with no downside now because it's just replacing a card that's already in their deck and not making it any worse yeah so this was probably like my number six i think that it was like really close between this and the ambusher um the reason this didn't make my list is even though it is just obviously going straight into tron it's just a strict upgrade over um the other filter lands like you said tron doesn't really want to always sacrifice their lands and they don't all often really care about how big the creature is like once tron's ready to turn the corner and kill you I don't think it matters what they do it with. Yeah, this is upside, and it is really powerful. I just didn't know if it was more powerful than some of the other cards, and that's why that's just why it didn't make my list. It was like really close between this and my number five. Yeah, I, I, I love it, and I think that even if they don't care that much about the ability, they have it now. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, no, it's definitely it is definitely guaranteed to see play. Yeah. Like it's probably one of the few cards in this set that is one hundred percent going to see play in a tier one deck in this format because every Tron deck just plays this card. Yep. I just didn't necessarily feel like it was more powerful than the potential of some of the other cards. Despite the fact that it is 100% going to see play, which is, yeah. I guess, like, kind of a paradox, but, like, it's going to see play, but I don't think it's more powerful than some of these other cards that might not see play. That doesn't make much sense to me, so... <laughs> but I think that's just the nature of, like, the deck that it would see play in, right? Like, I don't necessarily believe that it's a very powerful effect, but... There's already a deck that's playing a worse version of this card, so obviously you would put the better version of that card into your deck. Yeah. So my number two is Defile, which we've already talked about. So should we just talk about our number one? Yeah. Can I read it? Yes. We, by the way, have the same number one. Um, it is Fairy Seer. It's a single blue for a 1-1 one, one with flying. It's a fairy wizard. Uh, when... F Fairy Seer enters the battlefield, you scry two. Why did this make your number one? So this card is obviously like comparable to Fairy Miscreant. On its face, it does something immediately, so it just gets the, you a bit of value like as it comes into play. So even if it's removed, you've still got something, whereas Fairy Miscreant, if it's killed right away, it's just a 1-1. One, one, you know, it's a wasted card, a wasted mana. This card, however, doesn't really stack with itself, but... The obvious synergy here is that it is a one-drop fairy to enable Ninja the Deep Hours and Spellsitter Sprite decks. Yep. I think the fact that this is getting an immediate effect rather than uh, Fairy Miscreant that, that doesn't have an immediate effect, uh, like the first one that you play, I, it could just be that all of them are going to see play just so that that deck is as fast as possible and as consistent as possible. I think this card adds a just a ton of consistency to that deck of like later game you're going to be able to keep scrying lands to the bottom so that you just keep going and your opponent's going to be drawn lands or whatever um and then you can find your counter spells more often i it, everything that this card does i think is just going to be amazing like yeah. i do think it's funny that i just like got off my soapbox about prismatic caves how just because it's like auto include into an existing deck doesn't necessarily make its power level and the reason that fairy seer is at the top for me is because of its synergy with existing cards but i think that's just because this enables that synergy this powers up that synergy so much relative to the caves that i think it's worth being at number one yeah i i do think that that's worth it um i i think one of the big questions right now is does this go in over? Does this go in over uh, Miscreant, or does this go in alongside of Miscreant? I, I love that this can secrets. I think that like you play, you play sixteen fairies or twelve fairies, the ninjas, and then maybe like some elusive spell fists and a couple augers, and you just are like a more grindy mid range, more all in on ninja the deep hours. Elusive Spell Fist is a good way to close out the game. Dang. Because I was hoping that the Scry 2 was going to help set up your Delvers and like ensure that your Augur of Bolas is going to be hitting. So it does I'm that, like... too. I, I think that if you're going to play Delver of Secrets, the answer is cut Miscreant, play this. Okay. But I think that like this now just enables a really powerful just mid-range Fairies deck. That I think was sort of missing a piece before. Yeah, this this card is powerful. Like I'm I'm big on this card. Uh, I don't have much else. I just want to say that in our honorable mentions, we included a lot of cards, and I think we beat up on most of them, just because we know how competitive the the format can be in terms of card choice. So I think that our top five. I think most of these we we think we'll see play and then there's a few other ones in there there was one card outside of the honorable mentions that no one is gonna play besides me so we didn't even include it um and i think that i'm gonna make a youtube video with it in the next few weeks so maybe tune into that if you want to see me play a, a new card it's the 
the six mana four three with flying if you want to look it up but anything else before we sign off nope i am ready to get out of here okay end time Cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. That was Common Knowledge Episode 70 with our Modern Horizons set review. If you liked what you heard, you can support us at Patreon at patreon.com forward slash common knowledge. There you'll get access to uh, the graph. Sean has a big graph spreadsheet of all the power rankings. You'll be able to see the Common Coliseum. Unfortunately, I've had some issues trying to upload the last episode that Sean and I had recorded. I'm going to give it a try again, Um, and if not, I don't know, maybe we'll just have to try to record something else. I don't know. Our goal is to try to get one uploaded a month now that I am a little more savvy with the editing software and the uploading process. So just keep your eyes peeled for that if you're a patron. Uh, We're still still just plugging towards that stretch goal for the five-card blind tournament. If you are unaware of what that is just go to the patreon page and you'll be able to see all the rules and details about that and of course you'll be eligible for our card of the week drawing again congratulations to stephanie on winning that this month don't forget to check out our sponsors puremtgo.com and inkgaming.com use that coupon code ccmtg10 at checkout to get yourself 10 percent off on your purchase and lastly if you want the last way that you can support the show is just go to constructive criticism on YouTube and subscribe because well the better that network does the better we do and if you would like to email us you can do so at commonknowledgemtg at gmail.com you can find the podcast at CK Podcast MTG on Twitter as well as searching for common knowledge on Facebook to join our group if you'd like to reach out and find me, you can do so at Twitter at bclark underscore ck. Or again, you could just find me in that Facebook group. Sean, if the lovely listeners would like to get in touch with you, how is the way in which they would do so the touching? They can the follow reaching me on... out for the touching. <laughs> they can follow me on Twitter at lobbert8. That is L-O-B-B-E-R-T and the number eight. And then they can also search for me on YouTube if they just type in Lobbert. I do popper videos. Uh, I do go run through leagues, usually with brews, but um, also with also with meta decks sometimes, depending on you know how I'm feeling. But just posted a pretty sweet video that you're excited about, right? Yeah, I pl- I posted my mono white control deck, and what I say all the way through that is that I need to avoid playing against blue black control or blue black delver and i do precisely that in the video and it performs extremely well i think now that that deck is banned that it's a really good deck since making that episode uh i've i have completely overhauled my overlay like i actually made an overlay and it looks beautiful and i'm just looking for an excuse to make a new video and and show that off so i'm super psyched nice Okay, well, thanks again for listening. We'll see you guys next week.